The Dick Cavett Show. With Jane Fonda, Peter Fonda, Mort Saul, the Most Reverend Dr. Michael Ramsey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Bob Rosengarten and the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Cavett. Always remember that the longer you applaud, the less my monologue is. <laughs> okay. This is what is known as, as my uh, brilliant opening monologue bit. And the initials of brilliant opening monologue bit spell bomb, <laughs> as we say in show business. Speaking of initials, I had another lousy lunch. I gotta get a new... Uh, there's a little restaurant right near here we send out, and when you order a BLT and they ask you to spell it, you're in big <laughs> trouble. But I just thought, I, hey, it's, do you know how this is? Second Friday of the 13th of this, uh, in the last two yes. months? Do you feel the calendar is trying to tell us something? That's a little frightening. I'm not su uh, superstitious. Um, I will do anything on Friday the 13th that they say you're not supposed to, just because I'm not, I'll walk under ladders, black cats can go back and forth and cross my path. There are a few things I wouldn't do. I wouldn't call a member of the Mafia a fat, fat water rat. <laughs> Friday the 13th, but... <laughs> you know that it's Sammy Kay's birthday? Really? Today. And I, now, now don't I go, didn't buy him any. Don't go crazy, but... Sammy Kay used to have a show, some of you are too young to remember, called So You Want to Lead a Band. He had a band very much like ours. Anybody could conduct it. And... Uh, oh. That's what... We're, well, listen. Uh, no, no equal time here. This is a peculiar thing. Somebody was looking over government employee statistics in the paper and copied this out of the column of items. It's an interesting statistic. Our National Commission on Fine Arts has six employees. The Commission on Obscenity and Pornography has 29 employees, <laughs> which makes it about, uh, well, you can multiply how many times more important that is than fine arts. And the Commission on Battle Monuments has 422 employees. <laughs> interesting priorities there. Isn't that strange? You realize if you came up with an artistically pornographic battle monument, you could tie up 457 members of the government in one, in one assignment? How's that for a smashing closing line? Where were you? Just a second. I don't want to hear it. 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 Listen, we have a, a, a terrific lineup tonight. I don't want to waste another second because we have Jane Fonda, Peter Fonda, Mort Saul, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Dr. Michael Ramsey, and we will be back with all of that and probably more, uh, after, for all you gals who know how to keep in shape, here's how to keep your sweater and fine fabrics in shape. <laughs> Armor, Golden Star Ham. When buying a canned ham, remember the honest ham. <laughs> Not to be confused with your humble servant. Now, Armor really has a, a terrific ham going for them. Um, <laughs> it's the truth. Say, sometimes, uh, we got a lot of wires. We've been getting a lot of them lately, and uh, sometimes you just have to read one, at least, because I especially appreciate this one. It's from the Lindens in Peoria, Illinois, and it says, uh, as it, uh, Western Union just delivered it today, Dick Davitt, um, <laughs> congratulations on the minest moments of the Mediahas noun rigaho on. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I think I know what you meant. Uh, my first guest is a beautiful, fascinating movie star. Following Armour Ham, the beauteous Jane Fonda. And a lovely thing you are, too. Oh, thank you, Dick. Do, do you remember me? Yes, I do. Of course I remember you. Do you really? Yeah. 
How about that? Where, where do you remember me from? The last time I was on the show. You were on the show once before. Yes, I was. Yes, no, I know that very well. But do you remember the first time we ever met? This is a terrible thing to say. No. What's the first time you ever remember meeting me? On your show. Really? Yes. Ah, uh, I'm crushed. That was the fifth time we had met. Really? Do you believe that? No, you, uh, at, during, when I was in college, you used to go with a guy who lived uh, in the same college I did. And you were eating in the dining hall one day. And I said uh, hello, and you said hello. Then the second time uh, was about a year and a half later, and I, I saw you in New York, and I said, I once said hello to you in the dining hall at Yale, and you said, oh, <laughs> did you? And the third time was um, about a year later, and I said, uh, I recalled the other two things. And, <laughs> and you said, buzz off, Mac, I think. No. Don't no, remember that? No. no I, well, maybe, maybe none of that's true then, but uh, part of it is anyway. So, Don't take it personally, though. I won't. No. If you forget me now, during this conversation... Then you can take it personally. If you suddenly turn and say, where did you come from? Uh, how long have you been sitting there? I'll be hurt. <laughs> there are more sides to you lately than ever. Um, I thought we had seen them all in Barbarella, but you, uh, by this I mean you're really a uh, serious actress now, much more so than even before. I mean, a lot of people said you were greatly talented, not just beautiful. But now since uh, they shoot horses, don't they? They're really, they really are convinced. D do they act different? toward you now? Does anyone treat you more seriously? Or... Uh, you forgot yeah, me, right? I, <laughs> yes, I guess they do. People treat me no. more seriously because of that, because of, because of things that I'm talking about, because of things that I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, it's a very good feeling, as a matter of fact. How concerned are you about the fact that you're, you may get an Oscar? It would be very nice. Yeah. Do you dream about it? Does it mean a lot? Does no, I've got other, lots of other more important things to dream about. Such as? Oh, wow. Well, the kind of things that I'm discovering, the kind of things that I've been listening to and hearing and... and uh, Can you speak up just a bit for the balcony? Yeah, you can't hear me up there? I've been having lots of dreams about the kind of things that I've been seeing and hearing and finding out about, and some of it's mm -hmm. very disturbing and... Uh, uh, I guess those are more important things to dream about than Oscars. It would be very nice if I got an Oscar, though. Mm -hmm. But uh, who knows? You were in the papers not too long ago with something that had happened involving an uh, army base and, and some Indians. Or am I confusing two items at once? Well, they're, they're, the media confused a lot of things. Well, I, it was, I was very confusing. I saw a short it, item about uh, it, and I never saw anything else about it. It was one of the things that, that proved to me, of course, I already knew it, that you never can believe what you read in the newspaper. I was. Mm. I, I discovered that I had led troops of Indians onto several army bases and was in stockades with them. And what actually happened was I went to the state of Washington uh, to visit a GI coffee house and to uh, talk to some Indians up there about the fact that their fishing rights have been taken away and they're dying. Uh, they're starving to death because of it. Uh, while I was up there, I found out that the Indians were planning to occupy an army base in protest against the fact that uh, their demands for the right to the land, all non-used federal land, goes to the Indians by treaty. And uh, when they have tried to ask the officials to let them use the land to build a cultural center and a university, nobody's been listening to them. So they thought, well, people will listen to us maybe if we, if we occupy the base. And I thought, well, if I'm there, perhaps by virtue of my presence, there will be less brutality. Yeah. So I went on the base. Um, <laughs> with a couple of Indians and a friend of mine, Mark Lane, and uh, didn't see any Indians any place except the two that were with me. I didn't, I didn't know what had happened. I thought maybe there'd been a mix-up. Uh, but the, the, the army knew what I was there for, and they asked me to leave, telling me that the base was closed to civilians, which wasn't true because there were civilians coming off and on the base all the time. And, uh, Did they know who you were? When they yeah, sure, yeah. they knew who I w was, and they knew that I was involved with the Indians up there. And they asked me to leave, and I said I wouldn't go because there was no reason for me to go. And they dragged me off. And uh, I discovered later that we'd served as a diversionary tactic without meaning to. The Indians had, during that time, occupied the base at another point. Um, and, uh, you know, you laugh, but it's really a very serious thing. People are not listening to the Indians. They're not trying to help. There's no, there's no way that the Indians can make themselves heard. So they're occupying these pieces of land. Uh, which are theirs by right of treaty. Uh, well, that was the thing that happened in the morning. In the afternoon, I went on to another army base with a group of GIs, 
to talk to the soldiers, uh, just to find out, you know, what they thought, uh, the ones that had been in Vietnam, the ones that were going over, and to invite them to the coffee house that night. And I was arrested and taken to a provost marshal's office and detained there for over three hours and given expulsion papers saying that I had broken a law. And when I asked the colonel what law I had broken, he said, I don't know. However, I was given my paper and I, and I left. Uh, yeah, I well, saw you it, had it, been you know, it made me think about a lot of things. Uh, the fact that those of us who, who do speak up about things we believe in, about the war in Vietnam, about, about uh, the fact that a lot of people's rights are being taken away from them, that people don't have a way to speak up and defend themselves, that when one tries to say these things, to voice a, a protest, you get shut up, you get put in jail, or you get arrested, or you get thrown off army bases. There are lots of people in, in my business who are, you know, coming on the base and making a lot of people laugh and urging people to go overseas. They can stay on the bases and get a lot of people all worked up. And if I come on, I'm, I'm thrown off. I, I find that this is discriminatory. It's isolating the GIs. Uh, and I want to do something about it. I don't think it's fair. When did the, specifically the Indian subject impress itself on you so much that you wanted to do something about it? Well, I guess it... Uh, you know, I've tried to think back over how, how it happened that little by little I became uh, concerned to the point where I wanted to take a, a direct political and emotional stand in certain issues. It started, I guess, about four years ago. I, I was living in France. And stories started coming in, uh, as they do, easier in France than they do in America, about what's been going on in Vietnam. And, you know, I found it very difficult to believe. And I said to my French friends, I said, I... If, if the American army and uh, if the Marines and, and our government are doing these, these things, uh, they must be okay. I mean, we're Americans, so they must be okay. Then I started finding out more things. I started seeing film. I started hearing GIs talk. And I began to realize that maybe they weren't okay. And that maybe, as Americans, we are just as capable of atrocities, of mistakes, as all the other people in the world. We're no better, but we're no worse. And it's important for people to realize that that just because the system says something is right, that it's right, maybe it's wrong. Well, once you face that, you have to start re-examining a lot of things. Your own personal position vis-a-vis -vis the system. Are we free, each one of us? I began to realize that I wasn't free. As a woman, I wasn't free. I was discriminated against. Even as an actress, as someone who wants to talk, I was discriminated against. Then I went to I India. And I made a point of going to the very poorest parts of India, in Calcutta, for example, where the poverty is so extraordinary. Uh, it made me admire human beings that we can survive those kind of circumstances. Well, I would come back to my first-class hotel and look out the window, and there I would see middle-class Indians playing golf and mink coats and all this, and I thought, wow, you know, these people are just not seeing what's happening. And I started getting upset, and then I thought, well, it's happening in my own country. I mean, my own Indians, the Ind American Indians, are being uh, wiped out. I'll go back and do something, and you've got an ad coming up, right? How can you tell? Yeah, I can tell your eyes, eyes are glassing are over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's that. What is that? Is it... They're applauding for glassy eyes? <laughs> I don't understand that. Uh, you brought an Indian friend with you. Yes, I did. Or one, uh, at least, that yes, we're going I to did. meet after this message. Yeah. And now a word from another fine product. Do you want to introduce your Indian friend? Yes, Please. yes. I, uh, a girl, an Indian called Laneda Means, who is a, of the Bannock tribe. It was once a great Indian tribe. There are now perhaps three or four families left in Idaho on the Fort Hall Reservation. And I, she was one of the f original 14 members to occupy Alcatraz. And I thought it would be interesting for her to, to come here and perhaps talk about some of the things she's been through. All right. Her name is? Laneda Means. Means. Laneda? Yes. Could you make one thing clear to me about the Indians' claim to the land that they're on? Jane said something earlier, and it was not, it was not exactly clear to me about the treaties that we have with, with Indians. Yes, there are treaties uh, in specific. You know, the reason why we took Alcatraz, I could mention the Sioux Treaty of 1868, but then there's also congressional enactment within 
the last part of the 1800s that gives us title to the land as well. Not only that, but then the government gave us, you know, our reservations in accordance to our treaties. There's no question. The reservations, there's no problem with. By this, I mean, and there are problems on the reservations. But I mean, your right to the land is. is no, there's questioned. no problem at all. We just mm -hmm. want the government to live up to their part. There's a great deal of problem. They're taking it away from them. That's what they're doing. I mean, are they are they trying to take away things that are now reservations? Not, not like the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota or the Pine Ridge. Well, legally, we Rosebud. have every right, mm -hmm. but we are having problems in them trying to take the land away from us, yes. They've been doing that for quite a number of years, and it's been quite recently that now they're trying to terminate the Indians and take the reservations away. I didn't realize that. And putting dams on every reservation and flooding mm -hmm. us out as well. What specifically has happened to you uh, because you were an Indian? Well, that's a, what was your childhood it's a long like? story, what did you live actually, in? but... What kind of house did you live in? Well, I imagine your question is probably looking towards what, what's it like on the reservation, yes. or what is the reservation about. Uh, there, are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things that, you know, go on, especially when, you know, you're completely controlled by a bureaucracy. And, you know, like I'm... Like I was telling Jane earlier, when the Secretary of the Interior is like the president to, to the Indian people, and he appoints the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, who then in, uh, in turn appoints the superintendent on every reservation, and we haven't had the right to select who we want, you know, so that we can control our own affairs, then it really leads into a lot of hardships, and the, people, the people's lives are are pretty bad because of this type of a situation when, when people can't have anything to say about you know, their own lives or future or even their own destiny. What can you tell me about the suicide rate among Indians? I think it was uh, the late Senator Kennedy who made that fact known to the country that the suicide rate was so depressingly high among, uh, uh, maybe it was the Navajo, but I don't know if it's true among Indians in general or not, is it? Well, Fort Hall, which is the reservation that I'm from, leads suicide over 10 times the national average. And this is, you know, it's just an example of, you know, the type of conditions that we're subject to and the type of treatment that we're subject to as well because since the civil rights law, you know, they've, they've tried to say a lot of good things, you know, for all people, but I guess it doesn't apply to us because they've taken down the signs, no dogs or Indians allowed, but the feeling is still there and it still exists among the people. Where were those signs? They were in the nearby reservation towns, mm -hmm. uh, well, off the reservation and in the nearby cities. No dogs or Indians allowed? No, so I guess that's why they sent us on relocation was because they wanted to push termination for the Indian people and assimilate us into the cities. So they established this program called relocation which we better term as dislocation, and they take us to the cities and proceed on from there. Assimilation, you'd, you'd, would it be fair to say that the Indian in general does not want to be assimilated into society, that what you want is to remain on the reservations, to have better conditions on them, and to, um, we want to preserve your culture? Is that too We want to stay alive, from? because as it is right now, you know, with the suicide rates as high as it is and with the type of conditions that we're subject to and the dictatorship that exists, then we, we just want to stay alive and we want people to understand us and try to understand what's, what's going on in this country today because if they took some time to look into the situation that is going on, then I'm sure you know, they could not sit back and let something like this continue. It's, it's terrible. How, would, how can they look into the situation? What can they read or find out about it? Well, for one, there's a book called... Uh, it's called Our Brother's Keeper yeah. by Edgar Kahn. It's very good. Mm -hmm. Our Brother's Keeper, and then you could look into the uh, Senate subcommittee reports on Indian, and, uh, Indian education. What about Custer Died for Your Sins? Do you know that book? By Mr. Vine Deluria. I've read them both. I find, you know, if for just a person who wants to find out is clearly and easily as possible. A book called Our Brother's Keeper, as, as Lynetta said, is, re is, the, is the best thing. I, I just, uh, one of the ways that any citizen can find out the best is certainly not reading the newspapers uh, or watching television. It's to go to the source. 
you know, as I, I went to Alcatraz, well, everybody can't go to Alcatraz, but people who live near reservations or, or if they live near the relocation centers to go and to talk to the Indians, they won't believe what they'd find out. And I can't, and I, and I am sure that when a human being, any American would find out what is happening to the Indians, they would take action. I, I'm optimistic, perhaps, but that's what I believe. Who are your friends in Congress? Uh... Senator Kennedy, uh, McGovern, uh, Mandel, Harris. Mm -hmm. And I might add that in the state of California, we're looking pretty good politically as well because Jess Unra just sponsored a bill to giving title of the island to the Indians on Alcatraz. And it passed unanimously on the floor, 52 to 0. So we are looking pretty good politically in the state of California as far as the Alcatraz issue is concerned. Mm. As far as other things are concerned, we still have a lot of things to do yet. I and mean, a lot of people have to start, you know, looking around and try and find out about, you know, what is going on. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming and telling us that. We'll be back right after this. I can't believe uh, that I'm about to introduce the gentleman I'm about to introduce. Uh, last night at St. Patrick's Cathedral, one of the great, I suppose, symbolic occasions of the ecumenical movement among Christians took place when the Archbishop of Canterbury met with uh, his primate of the Church of England called on Cardinal Cook, who was Roman Catholic Archbishop of New York, and they prayed together for the future of the ecumenical movement. And this was the last official act of the Archbishop of Canterbury before he returns to England. I assume his visit tonight is unofficial but we are honored to have him here, the Most Reverend Dr. Michael Ramsey, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Very nice to meet you. I'm really glad to have this chance of a discussion with you. Your grace mm. is correct, I assume. Yes. If you like. All right. Uh, mm. I, um, I have the strangest feeling in speaking mm. to you because mm. I played you once. I know that sounds strange, but once I was in a summer stock production yes. of the Richard III, and the Archbishop oh. of Canterbury has a, a role mm. in that. Oh, he has I, indeed. Yes, yes I had yes. lines like, a messenger awaits, yes. what news? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was not the yes. best part, but it was, uh, it was, it was worth doing, I think. Um, where shall we begin? Uh, shall we talk about church attendance? Uh, they say it's off in England. Yeah. Uh, when I, it, it, it's not off. Uh, it, it, it's uh, uh, now remaining... Uh, much as it's been for the last few years, it, of course, there had been a very big drop in England, uh, undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. My guess is that in America, you're about beginning to have that drop now. These things uh, go in cycles. There's the great uh, growth of secularism uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, modern world and the fact that our Christian civilization is rather... Uh, old and tired and stale, but I can say this, that where there is a, a church going, it's a church going with a far deeper conviction. Uh, the, we've got congregations in England of most deeply convinced Christians holding together and serving the community, and it's the, it, it's the quality of our church life that one cares about, whether it's in England or in America. So you don't put that much stock in attendance figures. Well, it's I'm, the... I'm, 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 I'm grieved, of course, at a falling away of, 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 of religion. But uh, uh, nothing's achieved by being mournful about it. And I prefer to rejoice in, in the very impressive quality of, uh, of, the, of the Christian fellowships that we have got. To. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the person who has no religious connection, or at least no church-going uh, affiliation, but feels that he has a relationship with God that he can have privately in his garden or in his study or... Uh, well, of course, uh, a, a relationship with God 
Uh, mm. Or to link a man or a woman with other people who've got a relationship uh, with God. Uh, and if the religious fellowship is, is missing, there is something missing in the, in the God relationship. Of course, it, it, it's very often the fault of the organized churches uh, the, the, that mm. uh, uh, there are people, sincere religious, who are, le who are yet aloof from them. Mm -hmm. um, when you had this meeting with Cardinal uh, Cook last night, um, it was last night, wasn't it? It was, yes. yes. Uh, it was considered a historic meeting. And uh, m l let me ask you this. The word ecum is there such a word as ecumenism or is it ecumenicalism? Ecumenism is a word usually used. Is yes. it? Could you explain what that is first uh, and then uh, well, tell us what happened? Uh, ecumenism means the Christian outlook that thinks in terms of the total uh, Christian community in the world, that total Christian brotherhood within which uh, all uh, churches are, the attitude that looks beyond the boundaries of my own particular church and to realize my brotherhood with all Christians and to try to give the best expression to that uh, in acting and working together as fellow Christians. Can I ask a question? Yes. Mm. Um, why is it that, uh, that you mention a brotherhood with all Christians? I would think that by believing in God, one would feel a brotherhood with all people, be they Christians or whatever. Uh, uh, <laughs> certainly. Certainly. We are, we, I'm certainly. certainly. A, 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 a Christian... Uh, it, it feels the common humanity of all people, but as Christians we've got to bring something to the world, and that is our own definite belief, conviction, way of life, which we've got as Christians. And as Christians we hold together as the thing that we believe that we can offer to the world, you see. Uh, just while I share my common humanity with every other uh, human being, I don't share with every, every other human being necessarily the true way of life and the, and the true convictions, you see, and that's what we want to bring to the service of mankind. I must you interrupt really you because we are jammed I mean, up against a station a, break. We'll yeah, be right oh, back. Oh, please hold on. <laughs> the Dick Cavett Show with Jane Fonda, Peter Fonda, Mark Saul, and the most reverend Dr. Michael Ramsey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, will continue following station identification. Now we are back. You were just... Uh, did you two resolve your differences during the... Uh, uh, well, uh, there is no difference, you see. We're all human beings, and there's a brotherhood uh, of, the, uh, of, of the whole uh, human race. But there is nonetheless a difference between Christians, communists, uh, atheists, good people, bad people, and so on. And within this whole human race, which we all love and care for, uh, the, there must be people who stand for something, you see. And yes, as Christians, but I mean, you do, do... As Christians, we do stand for something I, I distinct mean, from what atheists, communists, or Buddhists stand for, you see. Uh, but I, it's I interesting that you group them together. That's very and interesting. I don't... That was an illustration of things that are different. <laughs> But you do realize, I mean, I, I was curious, as the Archbishop of Canterbury, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you do feel that there are, in fact, many ways of worshiping God and each one is as valid as the other, you happen to have chosen your way, but you do feel that there are many ways. Well, it's, uh, uh, there are many ways and there can be elements of, 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 of truth in, in, in all of them. But, I mean, the question is, is, for instance, is Jesus Christ the true, final, perfect revelation of God. For some people. Uh, well, he, he, either he is or, 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 or he isn't. If he is, if he, if he, if he, if he, if he, oh, if no, he is, if he, if he is uh, then it, it's important that we should bring people to, 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 to realize it. I think you're asking a very, yes. uh, mm. uh, an impossible question. I mean, you can't no, ask one... it's not impossible. It's no, so simple. You, well, you can't ask one religion question. to admit that it has part of the truth, but that some other one has but the rest of the truth. But wouldn't it be beautiful if... If each religion could uh, say, this is the way I've chosen, but there, it is conceivable that Buddha did exist well, also. Well, put it like this. Conceivable. These uh, are very naive uh, questions, there, I know. There's, I, I, there's I, truth in Buddhism, there's truth in Hinduism, 
uh, there's truth in uh, Islam. Uh, yet, uh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the perfect revelation of God, the full and flawless image of God, so that Jesus Christ is the true fulfillment of all the different world religions, though there's truth in all of them. And feeling that. Feeling that, you feel that it is the duty of those who believe that way to convince other people that yes. that is the truth. Uh, to is combine a great respect for that truth that they've got hold of with an insistence that Jesus Christ is the truth. Now, that doesn't mean being arrogant ourselves in relation to them, because it isn't ourselves that we commend. I don't commend myself. I commend Jesus Christ, whose servant I am. Mm. I'm his servant. May I ask yes. a question now? Oh. Uh, Archbishop, you've taken uh, positions, um, of very strong ones, I believe, on abortion and capital punishment and homosexuality and uh, divorce, uh, to name a few. A few, yes. Uh, and how has this affected you among your colleagues, and why did you feel that those specific uh, things needed reform? Uh, well, uh, uh, take, for instance, uh, uh, as a Christian, I believe that capital punishment is wrong because it devalues a human life. Homosexuality, I believe that while homosexual acts are sinful, I believe them uh, to be sinful, yet I thought that the laws against homosexuality uh, didn't help people who wanted to be helped uh, to get the help which they need, and thus in the interests of justice uh, and compassion, I was in favor of a change in those laws. On the question of abortion, uh, the line I take as a Christian is one that many of my fellow Christians uh, I know uh, take, uh, that the human fetus is sacred. Wouldn't actually call it a person, but the potentiality of an eternal life and being sacred I would say that the human fetus can only be destroyed if the life and serious health of the mother is in jeopardy. Now, I and I would draw the line there on the abortion question as against what we call the social clause, you see. But those are just illustrations mm -hmm. of different lines that I've taken. I see. Now, when you spoke with Cardinal Cook, were, did you sense any irreconcilable areas between your church and the Church uh, well, of Rome? Uh, the, the, uh, he and I both know uh, that there are big differences, like the infallibility of the Pope, like certain dogmas concerning the Blessed Virgin, like the claim of the Roman Catholic Church to be the, uh, itself the one Catholic Church um, in the world. But it's a question of the proportion of things, and increasingly Roman Catholics and Anglicans uh, and Protestants are finding themselves wanting to emphasize the beliefs which they share and to witness mm -hmm. together on the basis of them while realizing that there are still unresolved differences. Can you envision a time in any distance in the future in which uh, all churches would be one? Uh, I don't envisage them all being under one uh, central organization, mm -hmm. but I visualize them being one in mutual recognition, uh, full communion, mm -hmm. a, uh, a common faith, and just complete uh, uninhibited brotherhood. And that, 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 I think, is the ecumenical goal that we would all share. Why do you think the phrase, God is dead, gained currency in the last couple of years? Why the, is it appropriate the, to our the, time? The, 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 God, the God is dead. Uh, I, they are, uh, it represented a kind of religious uh, malaise, a sickness in religion. A lot of people's religion uh, was sick uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and stale because their image of God was stale. Uh, and, uh, and dead. And the theories uh, about God being dead, which I think are philosophically valueless uh, theories, mm -hmm. uh, were giving the expression of this inner malaise in the religious situations. How do you feel about people who say the church has no business getting involved in civil rights and uh, mm -hmm. the ghetto and so on? Uh, that the church has certain other values, a well, church, uh, uh, it, it should preserve uh, certain beliefs, it uh, should, uh, preachers who talk about uh, re uh, civil rights and 
such things are, are wasting the time of their well, I believe congregations in the, uh, who came there for religion as so. uh, Our guide should be the two great commandments, the love for God mm. uh, and the love for our neighbor. Well, now, God is a God of righteousness, and we aren't loving him and, and, and serving him properly unless we can, can uh, care greatly about underprivileged injustice and in human relations, and I would say working for justice between the, the, the rich and the poor and different races and so on is a part of our uh, service of God. But at the same time, I wouldn't substitute philanthropy for our mm -hmm. uh, total responsibility to, to God, and the church both has to be serving humanity on the level of all human needs, and at the same time bringing men and women to the knowledge and love of worship of God himself. Uh, and though we're concerned with everything that goes on in this world, we're also concerned with heaven, which is the, 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 the goal we hope for all of us, you see. Can you we, have an atheist as a friend, or do you have...? Oh, I've, 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 I've lots of atheists or, or, or friend. I, mm -hmm. I regret their atheism, and they may lament my Christianity, but we can be friends. <laughs> see. What, uh, it, it, how, can any young man who is born in England hope someday to be Archbishop of Canterbury? Uh, well... He can hope, but, I uh, mean, can he achieve the... Uh, I, 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 I would say that that if he hopes uh, for the job, he's probably very misguided, because it's a very, very difficult job indeed that I, I don't think anybody would ever aspire to who knew what it was like. <laughs> if I were to wonder tomorrow morning or a week from now, in the middle of the day, I wonder what the Archbishop of Canterbury is doing now. He's doing now. What would I... Well, I, goodness knows, he, he does such a variety of things. You want, want to like to know. Well, uh, Let's say he, between one and three in the afternoon. Uh, 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 well, well uh, b b b b b between uh, w one and two in the afternoon, he might be having a little siesta, uh, upon ah. which a, a, a whole hard day's work depends. Th mm -hmm. That's a bad question. But what's he, what does he do in general? Mm -hmm. He looks after a diocese, like any other bishop, though he delegates a good deal of that responsibility. He's the presiding bishop. Uh, in the Church of England and does a lot of giving leadership in the general affairs uh, mm -hmm. of the Church of England. He's also the uh, presiding bishop um, within the worldwide Anglican Communion, and that's a family of Anglican churches, including mm -hmm. the Episcopal Church in the United States. Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury is in no sense a pope lording it over them. They wouldn't mm -hmm. tolerate that for a moment, but mm -hmm. he is a, a presiding bishop amongst equals, and that is in that way he does involve himself, for instance, in the Episcopal Church here in the United States, mm -hmm. and comes on visits of friendship, uh, fellowship, helping them. Very good. But between one and two, it's a nap. Yes. I see. Yes. It's a great honor for us to have you here, and thank you for coming. Well, thank you for this you, most Grace. interesting discussion. Thank you, too. Thank you. Very good. Very good. We have a message. We'll be right back. Please stay with us. Yes. And Peter so my next week's guests will be Harry Belafonte, Truman Capote, Jack Carter, the Clancy Brothers, astronaut Frank Borman, and Groucho Marx. Now, let me, uh, oh, I would like to introduce, you. Oh, please, no he's applauding, they won't even hear it. Uh, I would like to introduce a gentleman now who uh, I think is one of the most uh, exciting people you can ever see on a stage. If you ever see Mort Saul in a club, you're very lucky. He's uh, always um, aware of our foibles, he's a witty man and a funny man, and here he is, Morton Saul. <laughs> Dave Garraway's backstage, Dick, with General Westmoreland. What, what? And uh, I thought we'd update the show. Remember that, General Grant? <laughs> Certainly enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. It's about time the Civil War was cleared up. Uh, you played the Archbishop? What if I never, I may never get General Grant back now after that <laughs> remark. You played uh, the, uh, the Archbishop? Like I, a, I did, can you believe that? I was gonna say, that the pun would be like a violin, like a harp would be more in keeping. 
No, I did play the Archbishop in the... You didn't catch the Oregon Shakespeare Festival that summer? It was about 1956. Uh, Stratford on uh, what? The Bend River. Uh, Anyway, who was groaning when you said I was coming up? Who are those people? Groaning? Somebody groaning. Um, You have every right to groan. I'm, uh, Would you groaners mind identifying no, yourselves? I'm gonna. All of us more. I, yeah, I, well, I know. I want to consider I'll, it a compliment. Well, yeah, they should be aware of you. I want to talk about all that because you know you've uh, set the tone of the program very well tonight, and uh, I want to talk about uh, personally because a lot the audience uh, generally hears me you know make a few facetious remarks like uh, uh, priests are changing. Uh, they want to get married now that we don't, or something. Usually, you know, and they laugh, right? Yes. Or I say, uh, you know, my parish priest, this Father Gruppy, and uh, I confess to him I've been civilly disobedient, and I asked what I could do for penance, and he suggested burning the police station. <laughs> and all, and you know, so, but the question is, what about what's behind all that? As uh, Jane pointed out earlier, there are penalties uh, for expressing yourself. If you're on the wrong side, and the question is, what does that mean? What is the wrong side? Well, uh, I did a show in Chicago, which I'm sure you've done, Jane, the Earth Cups in it show, yeah. with Bob Hope for three and a half hours. Um, Bob Hope is one of my favorite comedians, although I've often said that I feel he's more to be obeyed than laughed at. <laughs> and uh, I asked Bob Hope why the Smothers Brothers have been taken off, and he said, uh, because uh, they were politically involved, and the feeling was they were not with our country. And I said, did you ever get that feeling from their work? He said, well, it's not their work. It's I know what their convictions are when they're not on the air, as if he was an abortive review. So there is such a thing as the right side and the wrong side, I suppose, presided over by uh, frightened little men. The question is, uh, you might as well be who you are, and you might as well be involved in what? You should be involved in the cause. What is the cause? The cause, oddly enough, is humanity. It's all of us. Because if uh, we're all going to wind up in the same place, as Garfield said in a good movie on uh, Channel 11 the other night. Uh, I know it's hard to believe that Channel 11 had a good movie, but try and go on. He said, He said, everybody dies. What can you do? Kill me, everybody dies. And yes, everybody does. I hate to sound ecclesiastic, but I think it's true. And uh, everybody dies. And I suppose if we're going to be ecclesiastic, we have to remember that uh, uh, the picture of Jesus is not what the motion pictures have given us, of a benign fellow running around as if he's with a group on the Sunset Strip saying, please love one another. Because if he had been like that, he would be like Oral Roberts or Billy Graham. He'd have television time and a lot of money. He wasn't like that. Or else he wouldn't have been crucified. And if you believe in the crucifixion, you should believe in the resurrection and be an optimist as well. So there's several options here. I brought along some material. Got any traffic jokes? (laughs) How about this traffic? Well, the only people that... And how about this traffic? Hey, and how about... Yeah. Well, the only people that keep uh, keep laughing about... um, all of this, and are, well, I should say, are optimistic about it. The other night I saw a talk show, not this one, oddly enough. Oh, you wouldn't be watching this one. Is I was that watching it? this one, but because oh. of my attention span, I was clicking. Oh, you know that thing? I can't uh, concentrate I on one subject. No one's doing that now. And, and uh, the mayor was on another program with a host. The mayor's always talking about what's coming. He has a certain faith in the future, mm. which is almost ecclesiastic. <laughs> it's coming in another, but that's his, you know, <laughs> soon. Not now, but soon. Well, you know, people always say to me, Where do you get the information? Where do you get the ideas? Uh, Well, I get them in papers that are available to everybody else. And if we have a moment, sure, uh, good. You're going to reveal who your writers are, if it lasts, are you? Yeah, once and for all. um, (laughs) I want to show you something. It's in papers that are available to you and ask you if you think about it. The last time I was on this program, when it was a morning show, Right. I like to think that I brought it into the evening hours. Like Wait a minute. Think... We were on the summer show. It was a summer oh. show, which was yeah. three times a week. That's right. That's right. So this is better for our discipline now to work all the time, five nights. That was, that was last uh, June. Right. At that time, I mentioned on the show that um, I had been in New Orleans where they were having a trial of a man who was later acquitted for conspiracy to kill the president. What happened at that trial? Well, we found out that a great deal of information, several hundred cubic feet, 
was classified, the majority of it, by the Central Intelligence Agency, openly. The government's very open about it here in our society. They said that, that material was not available. And we found out that almost everybody involved in killing the president was affiliated with the Central Intelligence Agency. And one of the witnesses I identified on this program said, uh, and it's to the credit of this network that they allowed me to say it to the public, if they're interested at all, and if they still are, that a man representing himself as a Treasury agent had come and threatened him about his income tax. Do you recall that incident? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's German. Are we cutting away? We have to cut away? Uh, yeah, we are, as a matter of fact. Um, we'll be right back. Okay. We go away, but we come back. <laughs> For me? <laughs> You were talking about certain yes. assertions that you had mentioned. And so when I left the studio of the Dick Cavett Show, and this is part of our general scenario, two Treasury agents walked with me down Madison Avenue. They're really? more comfortable on Madison Avenue than I am. Agents Winokur and Cohen, just to let you know this is not, you know, there's no discrimination in the Treasury Department. And the two agents said to me, uh, we want to know if any man uh, abused his power, as you stated on the Cavett Show. And I said, uh, I said, you realize that the district attorney thinks that the government is involved in the president's death. And one of the agents said to me, quote, hey, Mort, we're not CIA, we're Treasury. Now let me continue. These are newspapers which are available to all of you, the New York Times and the Post, you know, if the news is sold out at the stand. <laughs> <laughs> and you thought I lost my sense of humor. I think life is a ball. Not a bad title for an old movie that since has gone on television. Uh, this is from where the... Uh, pardon me? Yes. No, nothing. I just wonder where you're going to start here. Yeah, this is, well, I always wonder where I'm going to start, and I also am concerned with where I'm going to wind up. Oh! As luck would have it. Uh, this is from the New York Times on uh, Thursday, March 12th. Prince Sihanouk of Cambodia, just so we know our cast of characters. He said that the sacking uh, of the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese embassies in his country resulted from a plot to throw my country into the arms of an imperial capitalist power. He did not name that power, but, it's, but he talked about its reference to the fate of Lao, uh, Laos, I should say. Okay? That power. Agents provocateurs, in other words. Right, are you going to make the connection between that and the fellows and on the And the Central Navy? Intelligence Agency. We're going to talk about that uh, for a moment, if we, uh, if we may. Mm -hmm. the, uh, to continue here. President Nixon, you all remember President Nixon? I want to thank you all for helping me conserve the, the, the lot of time I have here by not interrupting me with applause for any of the leaders I mentioned. <laughs> I'll hold a handkerchief over the heads of all the various leaders later on. Um, the president said, we were in no ground actions in Laos, uh, yet uh, Army Captain Joseph Bush, who was killed in Laos, in air action, according to the president. But his widow tells the New York Post, Wednesday, March 11th, he was in the air directing operations on the ground. We have a semantical president. Wait a minute. Jane said earlier you can't believe anything you read in the papers. You can't believe anything you read in the papers? I thought she said that. Most well, are. she oh. said that the media had to be read with a strainer. <laughs> then we know in the Village Voice, I just wanted you to know it's available to all of you, in the Village Voice of March 12th, a mass circulation daily, mm -hmm. we have a fellow who went to Nepal for what's going on, the festivities there, the prince getting married. So one of the first people he met was a CIA agent posing as a priest. And as we go over <laughs> to maybe it's not as far a jump as we might imagine, then as we jump over to Atlas Magazine, which is a compendium of the world press, we have a remark. This is by Arnold Abrams, who is, works for the Far Eastern Economic Review in Hong Kong. He says, the Americans say we seek no wider war in Laos. And that refrain sounds all too familiar. And he goes on to say here, that Lawrence Devlin, listed as a political officer in the American embassy in Vientiane, the capital of Laos, is uh, the mission chief for the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA maintains and largely controls Vang Pao's army of approximately 15,000 full-time troops. The CIA, as a matter of fact, has the army attached to it for the Vietnamese War. The question is, people say, where do you get these crazy ideas? This information has been available all the time unless you choose to studiously avoid it. And even that is no insurance that you will live to your uh, majority. The Central Intelligence Agency, I won't say an agency within the government, because 
I don't feel so secure that it's in the government. The, uh, the question is, can they start what Stuart Simon can call, uh, I think very aptly, not an undeclared war, but an undisclosed war? And will we go along with it? And is there any power in the presidency, or do they start the wars, and is it then a fait accompli? The question is, why am I involved? Well, as John Kennedy, who has been relegated to being a casualty of World War II by the press, as if you have a long memory, you can remember him and his virtue and his optimism, that corona about him. John Kennedy said, would you like your English professor to stay in the classroom as uh, the enemy comes to the gates of Thermopylae, or would you like him at the gates? That's the question. Where are we going to be when they make the head count? The next question is, we have to stop, and we'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> In the February cover story of the, on the fund is in Time magazine, uh, they said uh, Jane, uh, Henry and Jane have something, uh, but little brother uh, with the big mouth just might have everything. Uh, <laughs> we will see if he has everything. Will you welcome Jane's swinging sibling, Peter Fonda? <laughs> I wish you wouldn't kiss actresses on my show. It makes a lot of the viewers nervous. And, it's, uh, it's, it's very showbiz. Big and news. What are you talking about? Do you have everything? We could count your fingers and toes and see fingers if you're perfect. Fingers and toes are all and... here, unlike some people. And, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So you're the man who killed the big movies, eh? <laughs> you know they're referring to you as that now in the, in the business? Yeah, I know. There's a lot of people who don't like uh, Dennis and me and Bert Schneider out there in California. Yeah. I think about three or four thousand executives had to pack up and move out. Uh, should anyone not know? It's because of the gigantic success of Easy Rider. The uh, a lot of big flips. Oh. Are... <laughs> um, I had a beer the last time I was here, didn't I? A full I beer. never noticed things like that. I wouldn't sure, have any, talk... <laughs> any idea. You did seem to have a, a lot more of something or other. Yeah, yeah, you had a beer, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> but, but about that now, uh, do they uh, have you followed out there because you have killed the big movies? Uh, they have me tapped. Yeah. Not in the bank, on the phone. Right. <laughs> oh, you really? Are you serious? <laughs> oh, come, come, come now. Come, come, come now. I have right here a little bit. Oh, see, I made no, Sarge. Wait a minute, sure. that's more tone work. <laughs> Peter that's and right. I, uh, Peter did my television show. I had a television show in yeah, California. Getting... It was like this, only for two hours, <laughs> and a radio show right for three you. hours a night. And uh, we were on together. And then I wasn't on anymore. He was forced to go into independent production, which wasn't a bad move. And uh, very fortuitous, as a matter of fact. Very good guest. You know. oh, oh, Peter Fonda? Oh, yeah. He waxes oh. on about humanity. Oh, I know. I know Peter. Oh, they had to censor that show. Do you remember that? Pardon me? They had to censor that show. The, the radio show they got censored. They did their very best. I said, Tammy, and they had to censor. I can't imagine that. Well, <laughs> it's true, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Want to make any more history here tonight? <laughs> I was going to ask you a couple of things, because you were together, uh, in, I mean, in the old sense of the word, of actually both being here. Um, this is the first, this is yeah. the first time, right? Yeah. Oh, this is a rare yeah. appearance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You do Not a rare appearance. No, it's just the first time we've been on the tube together. It is. Yeah. What, uh, what do you think I'm of I'm intimidated, it? I might tell can, you. Can you recognize your sister from what she was, say? Yeah. Pardon? Can I talk for a minute here? No, of course not. Take it away, folks. This it's is a conspiracy. Friday. Isn't this a conspiracy? And that's what they're all talking about, the conspiracies and everything. That's when two or more people can get together. That's defined by law. And say what they want to say. Yeah, just that they get together, you know. Oh, is it just that they get together now? I just if passed we, the If we had one more fund to hear, we'd have a conspiracy then. Or... We do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have another well, nowadays, fun? you know, I mean, I, I, uh, I used to think when I read the papers and I said, well, so-and-so has been arrested for inciting to riot, that I thought, well, you know, whether there's smoke, there's fire, there has to be at least a grain of truth. Mm. Having just been, uh, shall we say, arrested for demonstrating and inciting to riot, supposedly, I now know, uh, now when I read the papers, I, uh, I think, well, it's probably uh, a total myth. Right? I mean, we've all been through that. Both of you have been. You've been arrested. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, they consider me to be... When you've uh, been through it, you realize a that... political anarchist or something like that. Yeah. I saw you, you can on meet a somebody. Night, uh, talk show where a fellow considered you that. He shall go nameless, but I'll give you a hint of who he was. Uh, 
David Frost attempted to look into his alleged soul for 90 minutes and came up empty. Uh, a frightened little man, and he has every right to be. That's his only touch with reality. He talked to Peter, and he talked to him like, you know, he's passing out rifles after the program. You know, aren't, you, aren't you fellas copping out? I mean, kept looking at the dark glasses and everything. He was really worried. You know, like you're leading a conspiracy. People yes. are threatened very easily, aren't they? They are. It doesn't take much. Well, paranoia strikes deep, you know. I must admit, I'm paranoid, too. Not about the CIA, ABM, FBI, uh, communists, Catholics, junkies, Republicans, and even the members of the L.A. Country Club. But... <laughs> <laughs> I don't... Gentiles all. Have we left all... anyone out? Oh, no, you know, we could go on forever about it, but groups of people. I was very interested in um, you yes. getting it on with the... Uh, His Grace. Yeah, you know, because I agree, you know, I have to feel that... Uh, Either we're all God or there's no God. What, what would you call that? Somebody else agrees. That way, <laughs> there's a few gods up there too. They're high would, enough. That they that's the traditional them. direction, I know. <laughs> that's we orthodox. Have, we've come to another one of our fun pauses. We will be right back after another I fun pause. <laughs> It's us. We're all back. The fun folks. Uh, <laughs> Something just to occurred to me, Dick. You play Where? dad. I believe <laughs> you were playing house. <laughs> Got to go raise a hot. That, uh, I just went through Times Square, saw your sign. It says, people are the ultimate spectacle. But they shoot horses. That's, um, you're looking, you look confused. That's generic. Remember, it started with Lou Lair. Monkeys are the crazy. Then it's evolved. What a anyway, memory. What a to memory. To return to the point. Yeah, Lou Lair. Theatrical. Yeah, well, I believe in our industry. In order to understand the society, you must be a victim of it. And that's the reason, probably, that uh, the Indians and the black people show an understanding beyond their educational opportunities. Yeah. Also, we must remember, in answer to your question of how we trust the press, based mm -hmm. on Jane's earlier remarks, the press has always been on the side of power. And I want to give you an example. The day that the Titanic sank, a lot of you remember that. I think I was doing the show then. Anyway. Probably felt the New like York it. Times carried this, the following headline. It said, John Jacob Astor and 500 others lost at sea. Is that Good. the truth? Yeah, that's true. Well, that's, that's I would classic. never joke about anything like that. I'm glad the audience has a strong sense of history. <laughs> well, what, what you just said, Mort, is so true. I, I, uh, one of the other things that I did in Washington was to go to a penitentiary, McNeil Penitentiary, where I met with uh, a group of Indian inmates and then with all of the, uh, the inmates in a huge auditorium a more intelligent, sophisticated, sensitive group of people I have rarely spoken to. And there were, it was beautiful. There were black guys standing up and, and uh, c expressing concern for the Indians. And one guy, a black guy, stood up and he said to me, man, as long as I'm in prison, you're in prison. And that really struck me. Hmm. And well, it, like I, I, the meanings of the words were really brought home to me because of what happened the next day. What's well, become of light-hearted show folk? I think I, I woke think up this morning prison. and I... Did I hear you quoting Lincoln on the radio this That's morning? That's right. I, you got it right. All you have that? to do what these is days is if just take the Bill of Rights and read it uh, no, very read, read Lincoln's slowly. I, I say the Bill of Rights. Everywhere I go, everybody is asking for a Bill of Rights. Women Freedom are asking speech, for right? a women's Bill of Rights. Indians are asking for Indian Bill of Rights. It's true. I'll the GIs wanted I want to answer this question. Oh, go ahead. What was this question? Lincoln's, about an, Lincoln's inaugural address. I, I wasn't dreaming. No, you weren't dreaming. All right, wise me up. Uh, I can only paraphrase like the, the first part of it about uh, if you're dissatisfied with the government, it's your constitutional right to amend it. Or, you, <laughs> or and this is what NBC wouldn't let be said on uh, Tommy Smothers' show, uh, or your revolutionary right to dismember and overthrow it. That's a president of the United States. Wait a minute. Now, you understand, you understand that I could be arrested for crossing state lines to incite a riot by the, just the virtue of the words I just said, even though I'm quoting a president of the United States. Tales of Hoffman. Hmm. Was it Hoffman? No, I was just what? being facetious. I said <laughs> Tales of Hoffman. <laughs> but to, well, NBC was trying to keep the affiliates in line. They have per, other problems, but they, uh, not the constituents. They don't, they're too remote. You said earlier what happened to lighthearted show folk. Yeah. Interesting question. Remember, I mentioned the other night that on the old talk shows, politics never came up for months on end. Uh, what, that was during Eisenhower's administration, right? 
could very well have been. We're playing the trivia well game. Who was president in 56? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but strangely enough, that's the period when you seem to have emerged. Uh, actually, in 1950, you mean the Eisenhower administration? Yeah. Right. Uh, yes, and there's a good, good deal uh, more suppression now than there was then. That's true. That's you know, true. Th th something very interesting. The other day I was with a group of, of people, and they were talking about the Mac They were young, and they hadn't really been awake during the McCarthy era. But they'd heard about it, and they said, you know, listen, what was so terrible about the McCarthy period? <laughs> what happened, in fact, during the McCarthy period? People lost their jobs. Big deal. Hmm. What's happening today? The Jobs McCarthy period was once defined, lives. you know, President Nixon was a senator there, was helping Senator McCarthy. Somebody wants to find it as a period of uh, an eye for an eye, that every time the Russians would put an American in jail, Senator McCarthy would put an American in jail to keep the <laughs> balance. You remember that I reference? Remember that. So, remember that. I, I think you remember the person here. who said it. We have a pause and we return Heck after that one. <laughs> When the uh, time, when time did the piece on your and your entire family you fund is uh, Can I ask there was you a question because you just said before whatever happened to you know the. <laughs> I was about to get into show. it. I, I was about to. What? What I was about to say that they did a great deal of talk about your lives and your relationships with your father and all of that in the magazine. And I just wonder if that's ever uncomfortable for you and how your relationships are with him now. Fine. Are they? Sure. Everything's cool. Can I ask you something? Why would it be that? <laughs> Can I ask you why, when we asked him if he would come on tonight, he said, with those two freaks? <laughs> he never, he didn't. I don't believe it. I don't I'm believe not it. kidding you. Then he was, he's got a good sense of humor. He does have a yeah. good sense of humor? Yeah. I never, he's on the there are people that, that believe, that, 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 that uh, obviously think we are freaks. He just made a movie called <laughs> Cheyenne Social, how about this, I gotta plug his flick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Cheyenne Social Club, and he, he steals the picture. Really? There he is! Would you like to sit there and? Uh... <laughs> Why don't you like to sit here, Dad? Oh, look! No, no, I'm fine. It's the first. You, I was handed those just outside, Dick, and told really, me these are you. amazing. No one's ever given me anything like this. this. Is a picture of Jane. That's quite as stunning a picture of Jane as I think I've ever seen. Can you get a shot of this on camera too? Uh, here we are. <laughs> is that the costume you wore in Barbarella? <laughs> I'd Have like you, you to meet my this? sister. Amy yeah, I met Amy as you as you were walking out here. Too. Okay. I should. In, would you like to introduce sister. the gentleman who came out for the viewers and that's who my may not know over who there. it is? No. <laughs> no. Wait a minute. I should I deny parenthood here? <laughs> no. I'm silent Sam. I ain't saying a word. Do you know that Peter Fonda looked exactly as I did at that age? I know is that, that while you were at Yale? Or? No. <laughs> yes. This, that's incredible. Oh, Thank you. So. <laughs> How could anybody think that that is a subversive, communist, long-haired <laughs> critic? What's the last time you three were together like this, or you four About for that matter? Hour. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. Yeah. yeah. We but said goodbye to Peter, because he's flying west right after this show, so we said goodbye this to Peter. This is a total surprise to me. <laughs> that you're flying west, or that, that he's here? <laughs> uh, I see. Well, you two just go ahead and talk. You must have a lot to talk about. I wanted about. to ask the audience something, because you said before, mm -hmm. whatever happened to the kind of, you know, the, act, the showbiz people that come on and tell jokes. And I know that most people come here to this kind of show to hear jokes and to laugh and be amused. But from the kind of reaction that there is tonight, I get the feeling that, in fact, if people are talking about things that are important, that mean something to them, and if they're sincere, and you know that the, we're talking about all of us together, don't you prefer that? Yeah. It is, it's difficult. When you're an actor, people always like to classify human beings. If mm -hmm. you're an actor, then you don't get into anything else, you know. They automatically say, oh, well, you know, in between films you have time, so you get involved with something like that. And 
Sometimes we need to know that people are interested in the fact that we're interested and they are with us and they're not just here to have us look good and to talk about our films. It's important. And you've got, a, you've got an ad coming up, right? Yeah. Right. Your eyes are glassing over. Do you find it hard? <laughs> They're signaling me again. Right. Do you find it hard to uh, to interrupt Jane uh, when she's? He's the one that's together? hard to interrupt. Am I right? Impossible to interrupt, Peter. Yeah. Peter's the one. Really? If you didn't like Easy Rider, would you have told him, Mr. Fine? I did, didn't I? Yeah. Well, on the four-hour cut, he got very upset. <laughs> he said, It'll "I never said it's go. too long." Four hours. Oh, four hours is too, too long, long, but you like the movie in general. Yeah. Well, we got yeah. it down to 97 minutes. He liked it very much. What about Tammy and The Bachelor or whatever? Now <laughs> <laughs> you know what they... <laughs> now he's work. doing it. Mr. Big. Tammy and The Bachelor was, uh, well, now you know what one they of the early... Out, fellas. One of the early... Uh, that was my first film, and I compared part. that with my father's first film, Farmer Takes a Wife. I sure wish I'd done Farmer Takes a Wife. <laughs> What do you do next now? Are you making one? Have you ever thought of making one together? I mean, a sort we of We get all to... sorts of offers, mm -hmm. offers all the time. The, the one I'm making next, as a matter of fact, was originally given to me mm -hmm. to offer for me and my father to play together. It was totally wrong for us, but uh, I, it's all a matter of material. Yeah. Took war and oats. <laughs> <laughs> I needed somebody who looked a little older sure with more character. Is Amy thinking of being an actress? Are you? No, not you're, not, you're not interested. She's going to run the business for us. Mr. Fonda, what is your next project? Where will we see you next? You may not see me next. I mean, the next thing I'm going to do, unless no? you travel. Uh, I didn't really intend to talk about it, and I won't too much, but I'm N not preparing in 25 seconds, a you concert won't. tour, one-man show, which I will be trying out, sort of warming up and making my mistakes in private mm -hmm. in the Middle West. And if it works, then I'll come and talk about it a lot. A concert tour. But you should talk about uh, the Cheyenne Social Club because... I haven't seen it. You saw it. You I saw it. it. You took it. It's yours. <laughs> walked you off with the picture? Oh, walked off with the Jimmy picture. Isn't Jimmy Stewart also in it? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and they grew up together, too. It's only second time... Well, they grew up together in the business. It's only yeah. the second time, though, I think, that you've appeared with him in a flick, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. Have I got a, oh, some Coke or something? What like is that? it that you're doing we in 25 seconds? Yeah. Uh, it was that we were going to say right now that we're going away, and now it is true. Oh, I'd like to tell you something. Like that. Well, it's a pleasant surprise to be up to my ears in Fonda's, and I didn't expect to be that far up to my ears. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Morton or Mort. Does anyone ever call you Morton? Morton? I get, yeah. Just the, the people at Foundling Home where I stay. I don't have any folks. That's okay. <laughs> oh, okay. On that light note, Monday night's guests will be Harry Belafonte and uh, comic uh, Jack Carter and Dr. Gustav Eckstein, who wrote a book called Author of the or wrote a book called The Body Has a Head. Yes, and three lady movie censors from Maryland will be here on our stage. Is that something? Is that weird? <laughs>